That's very good. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to another discussion with our dear brother uh, Karim um, and um, Leslie Terabesi, otherwise known as uh, Abdul Karim. And we're discussing uh, the elements of the revisionist movement that's now a global phenomenon uh, amongst a certain of us who are academics and non-academics in the Muslim world. Brother Karim is uh, an academic who's now stationed in uh, uh, lives and works in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, where I was uh, years ago. Uh, we knew each other previously, and uh, now by the grace of Allah, we're brought back together to try and shed some light on the errors that entered into uh, Islam uh, and uh, within a hundred years or so after the prophet's death, peace and blessings be upon him. And the prophet even mentioned as much. He said this, you know, by the third generation after me, a hundred years after me, he said, people are going to look like me, but they're not going to be of me. I'm paraphrasing a hadith, which is relatively uh, accepted uh, by most people. Not that I'm a Hadith man, but these things, uh, some of them seem to fit into the historical narrative and uh, others uh, don't. And some fit into what is taught by the Quran and others don't. Matter of fact, the majority of Hadith do not fit with the Quran at all. And um, so what Brother Karim and I are in the process of discussing is the um, we're, we're, we're doing an apocalypse, if you will, okay, an unveiling, that's what that word means. It means a, uh, an unveiling of the man of sin. And when we talk about the man of sin, we're not talking about some beastie that's hiding in your closet or under your bed. We're talking about an entire organization of evil, political evil. And political evil often uh, begins with a religious mindset because the religious mindset is what establishes the culture of a nation. And so when we talk about the unveiling of the, or the New Testament talks about the apocalypse, which is not this big end time war scheme, we're talking about the revelation of the man of sin. Who's doing this evil? Who's responsible for it? How did they do it? Where did it come about? Where did it begin? And what mechanisms did they use? You see? Well, the initial mechanism is infiltrating the words or the message that uh, is brought by any one of the 124,000 prophets that have come to the earth. And then the people within two or three generations who want to take political control, they twist these words. You see, they twist it, they change it. They use subtle mechanisms which are considered in the world of the occult to be the ultimate form of magic, and that is to control the mind. That's what it is, to control the mind. So um, that's what's happening here. Now we're talking about a school uh, that is a contemporary school of thought, uh, neoconservatism. And uh, it began, in, I think it was the University of Chicago, uh, under a certain professor there. And uh, his, he um, began to write and uh, disseminate what he thought was a correct approach to uh, the political management of a society. And um, just like Plato did, I mean, all, all of these philosophers did, they, they took up a certain position and their positions weren't always wrong. And if they were wrong, it was a minor percentage of what it is that they considered the correct approach. There might have been a few steps here and there that were not exactly in keeping with what we might want to call divine order, but they're pretty close to it. Okay. So some people come in after these great teachers, whoever they might be, and they twist, you see. So um, I'm wondering, Brother, what happened uh, to the neoconservatives? How is it that they took a correct teaching and then twisted it? What did they twist and how did it become the exportation of an evil mindset 
uh, a satanic mindset, if you if you want to use that word. I can poetically use some license here and <laughs> make a new word and uh, export it to the world and then use excuses like uh, 9-11 and now COVID to, you know, export this tyranny when that's not what was being taught to begin with at all, even by uh, Plato, if we want to, you know, go back uh, to his narrative. So there's, you know, 2,500 years between both narratives and the same mechanism, the same kind of cult, the same kind of gang or club comes in behind these teachers as they did behind Jesus, as they did behind the prophet Muhammad, and twist the words, twist the doctrines, so that they can manage to take over political control of a cultural system that begins with some sort of religious belief. You see. So what happened here at the University of Chicago 20, 30, 40 years ago? Please tell us. I thank you. I was a man in a shaitan. Well, uh, okay, perhaps I should begin by uh, making it clear that I actually don't know what happened at the University of Chicago. And there's a very good reason for that, uh, uh, which is simply that, well, I wasn't there, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what I do know is that uh, Leo Strauss was uh, a teacher at the University of Chicago. But mm. then again, so was Fazlu Rahman, uh, you may yes. recall. Yes. In fact, I wondered quite often, I still need to find out whether they ever met each other or knew of each other. That would be interesting to know. Yeah. As um, I mentioned, I think in our last uh, talk, uh, Strauss was actually quite interested in uh, Arab philosophers, uh, Al-Farabi in particular. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, his, uh, I think, Farabi's comment, uh, commentaries on Aristotle uh, uh, were found very interesting. And uh, I understand that he, Al-Farabi, uh, with his commentaries on Aristotle, helped to bring Aristotle uh, to Europe, to the Europeans. Mm -hmm. But of course, this was only, uh, you know, as a part of the, if you like, treasure trove of ideas that the Europeans, as it were, imported from the Muslims in those years. Because as you know, uh, at that time, the Muslim civilization was, and this is admitted even by Orientalists and uh, perhaps even some Islamophobes, that the Islamic civilization at that, at that time was at its peak. They, uh, Muslims had the best scientists, they were the most mm -hmm. progressive in the sciences and what have you. Even philosophy flourished and there was a healthy discussion and debate. Ihtilaf, which is the scholarly disagreement, was tolerated. A dogmatism or taklid was something that only set in afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, probably due to political, uh, you know, pressures, as you, as you yes. mentioned. In this connection, I would like to mention a book by uh, Professor uh, Omar Ramahi. It's called uh, the, um, he's a professor of engineering, I think, at one of the Canadian universities. Mm -hmm. I'm reading through his book these days, and the book is called, it's available on Amazon.com. It was published in 2019, and it is called Muslim's Greatest Challenge. Excellent book. I highly recommend it. I would recommend it alongside with uh, you know, uh, Muhammad Shahru's book uh, of, uh, they share a lot in common, I think. Uh, Shahru's book is, uh, he, he's not with us anymore. He, he died some years ago, but Shahru's mm -hmm. book uh, was a big success when it was published, I believe, in 2007 in Damascus, Syria. Mm -hmm. But of course, it also aroused a lot of controversy. The 22 uh, ulamas jumped on him, tried to, you know, disprove him or refute him or what, what, whatever is the right, debunk him or whatever is the <laughs> word that people like to use. So, yes, so yes. He, when I heard that, I figured he must have done something right. Otherwise, he would not have elicited such a, such a response. And I believe he did get uh, most of it right. I have not been able to find anything really that I could quarrel with either in uh, Shahru's book or in Dr. Omar Amahi's book. Although I have to uh, uh, mention I haven't quite finished with Dr. Ramahi's book, but I certainly recommend it to anyone who wishes to, um, uh, you know, uh, co contemplate or consider an alternative narrative to the mm -hmm. traditional narrative that we have all inherited and that we are now experiencing a series of problems with because 
because it, a lot of this traditional narrative uh, seems, how do I put it, hard to hard to believe or hard to accept. So, because, to but, <laughs> yes, well, you could put it that way too. Like, yeah. uh, as, as far as food for thought is concerned, you, you could mm -hmm. get a case of intellectual indigestion by reading yeah. some of the stuff, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So you as a doctor, you know, the dangers of, uh, you know, oh, physical indigestion, just imagine uh, how problematic the intellectual indigestion could be. And in fact, we do have something like an intellectual indigestion. People are finding it hard to swallow certain ideas, for example, that the Hadith is revelation or that it is equal to the Quran or that it can abrogate, judge and even replace the rulings of the Quran. These difficult, uh, these ideas are very difficult to accept because they imply somehow that human beings are able to, you know, uh, reveal quote unquote text mm -hmm. that is comparable, uh, you know, to, to the Quran, which is very, very problematic because we as Muslims, I think, consider the, uh, the, uh, the Al Quran to be, uh, or the Mus'haf, which is the written transcript of the Quran, but I think I will use the word Quran here. Mm -hmm. We consider it to be the words of Allah, and so uh, really, uh, how can any any human uh, product compare to that? It cannot, and how no. could it be? How could it be placed even above the Quran, and even in some cases overrule the Quran, as happened in uh, cases of uh, the punishments for blasphemy, apostasy, and adultery? All of these death penalties were taken from human-based narrations, the Hadith, and they basically overruled whatever Allah Ta'ala legislated in the Quran yes, on this. Yes. On his, uh, so but I am just yeah, let shocked. Me, shocked. Let yeah. me inter interject here just a minute. So these books that you are referring to are written by men who have taken a critical historical approach to the analysis of these aspects of what has become Islam. Yes, see, in the traditional uh, perspective. So this is not just your opinion. This is the opinion of other people who have actually looked at the facts and looked yeah. at the histor history and the development of these facts and the development of these various sectarian movements, the development of these various ideas, if you will. OK, yes. and um, what we're talking about here is um, for example, uh, how can I say it? An analogy would be to set up the, uh, the Catholic uh, catechism, if you would, and uh, set that above the Bible or even the New Testament and say, well, this is what it really means. And uh, we have the final say on it. And this is what you are to believe. And don't think about it anymore. Uh, you know, I ran into this as a new Muslim. And I recognized it right away because that's what I was confronted with as a young man coming up in the Catholic system. I would ask questions and they couldn't answer the questions. And they said, just believe, you see, just believe. This is the tradition. This is how it is. You must trust us. And uh, now what we're considering here concerned ourselves with is this narrative, which has proven untrustworthy. So, we have a case of misplaced trust and we're trying to correct that and when you mention a reference such as you've just mentioned by uh, el shahid or whatever his name was um then you are talking about a solid uh investigation uh, you know typical i mean look when you want to know who the criminal is you, you've got to find out the evidence and you've got to find out the motivation, you see. And so in order to do that, you've got to have a very good detective. So these books are written by the equivalent of a, uh, uh, of a uh, police detective, an inspector, if you will. Okay. And if we want to just rely on tradition and the traditionalists, when you corner them, they're going to have the same response as a Catholic priest. Just believe, you see. Believe that Jesus is God, you see. That's, you know, that's just it, you see. So believe that Muhammad said this, despite the fact that 90% of the hadith have been proven to be fabrications. Oh my God. Well, this brings us to a conundrum, which has no solution other than revision, you see. And that revision is uh 
up to people like ourselves who just won't take belief for an answer. Because if you're going to have belief and uh, no good reason for that belief, then how are you going to be able to discern, you see, what is right from what's wrong with respect to political motivations and then political deeds, you see. And when I'm talking about political, I'm just saying this, we're regarding a form of action. So we're talking about deeds, good deeds versus bad deeds. So we're either performing good deeds or bad deeds depending upon what we believe. You know, so we have to get this sorted out. And I'm so happy and I feel so privileged to have these discussions with you, brother. And I just wanted to bring that focus uh, to our listeners so that they don't miss the importance of what it is that you're sharing with us, inshallah. Yeah, thank you. No, you are very right in, uh, in uh, bringing this to the attention of the viewers because actually Al-Quran reminds us uh, regularly not to be deceived by shaitan. Mm. His deception is a modus operandi of the of the evil uh, you know uh, forces and allah has allah Taala has given us the critical mind to help us to differentiate between truth and falsehood and he has given us our quran to help uh, to guide us and also to differentiate truth from falsehood so the uh, the procedure is actually not that complicated but it assumes that you will to begin with uh, that you are willing to use your akal your your mind or your intellect mm. Now, where the tradition is delivered a, a very serious blow to the rationalists is when they try to convince the people that to be a good Muslim, you actually have to shut your mind down. Mm -hmm. You have to, as you said, believe without asking why. And even up on, amongst a certain schools of thought, there's a popular saying, uh, they like to say, we, uh, we obey without asking why, okay? Mm -hmm. So now asking question has somehow become, uh, you know, a sign of a lack of piety. While mm -hmm. the Quran, from beginning to end, uh, uses expressions uh, such as, yes, alunaka, they ask you, and then the answer comes, cool. So Allah Ta'ala himself uses the question and answer uh, method in conveying mm -hmm. his revelation to us. Yes, but, he here, but here comes some of the traditional ulama, and they want to prohibit questioning. And even thinking, you know, you see. So, I see this whole movement as a as a massive assault on uh, uh, reason. And the tragic, uh, what is tragic about it is that, as I have put in some of my publications, what is tragic about it is that I just don't see how any person can, um, you know, uh, uh, be a. Uh, how do I put this? I don't see how any Muslim can uh, understand the Quran, the guidance that is given to us, without using his or her reason. Is that possible? And if you cannot understand the revelation, well, how can you possibly follow it? So the prohibition of reason uh, amounts to nothing less than uh, an attempt, uh, uh, whether they intended it or not, the effect is to prevent or make it hard, very hard sometimes, for people to follow uh, the revelation of the Quran, the Quran, as uh, the Prophet himself, peace be on him, was commanded, and as we are also asked uh, to do, you see. So prohibiting reasoning is almost tantamount to a prohibition of uh, understanding and following the Quran, and therefore it amounts to a prohibition of being or remaining a Muslim. This is yes, just so anti, anti uh, the, the, what is what is taught us in the Quran. It is the complete reverse. Yes. So uh, yeah. Um, by the way, Omar Ramahi has an interesting explanation why this uh, mm -hmm. backlash against the reason. Uh, uh, how it originated, and I have commented on this uh, as well, uh, but let me first, first share what, what his view on it. You see, uh, as uh, Islam was expanding and non-Arab people were becoming Muslims, such as the Persians and others, mm -hmm. and some of these people came from cultures that, uh, you know, valued rationality significantly, and perhaps more so than uh, some of the, uh, you know, uh, tribal Arab people, and some of these people, according to Dr. Ramahi, may have felt threatened by that intellectual uh, 
uh, ability of the new converts. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they began to withdraw into a form of tribalism yeah. and they began to sort of say, no, you bad things about reason and rationality and uh, they even came up with a, a hadith according to which the prophet allegedly said that anyone who uses his who uh, yeah, that uh, according to the prophet he, uh, the prophet allegedly said that so-called quote reason-based tafsir is a form of kufr or unbelief yeah. end of quote and they even had a uh, that a name for the people a derogatory term for the people who used akko mm -hmm. and uh, they tried to associate the use of uh, akko with with disbelief and with atheism and mm -hmm. of course historically speaking this was manifested in the political repression and mass murder of the philosophers mm -hmm. in 1786 yeah. by musa al hadi the fourth abbasi caliph the son of mahdi who actually initiated mm -hmm. this uh, pogrom or this uh, persecution of thinkers uh, six years earlier before this mass before this massacre took place uh, allegedly, some of the persecution of the rationalists was continued even under Haruna Rashid, uh, and it was the, the rationalist really uh, rationalism really uh, became the chief uh, policy of the caliphate. I think under Al Ma'mun, who was one of the two sons of Haruna Rashid. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is that this is an alternative, you know, uh, you know, uh, account of how this bias against rationalism arose. You may recall that by comparison, I was suggesting that the, uh, as it were, the um, marginalization of reason took place as a result of the conflicts between the rationalists and the traditionists yes. uh, and the disputes between the two groups on the best way or the better way to interpret and understand the revelation of the Quran. Mm -hmm. So the rationalists wanted to use their akal, their intellect, their reason to understand the revelation directly without any intermediaries which is what actually the Quran teaches, while the traditionists did not trust Akko and they wanted to uh, perceive the, the teaching of the revelation through the lens or the eyes of tradition, through mm -hmm. the eyes of the, the Sahaba and the forefathers and through the Hadith even. Mm -hmm. But once again, as uh, Dr. Omar Amahi points out in his book, uh, this claim that the Hadith explained the Quran is very problematic because at least from what he reported, there is not a single Hadith in the entire corpus that fully and comprehensively explains any verse in the Quran. And I have uh, come across information in other sources, mm -hmm. according to which a maximum of 15% of the Quran has uh, any Hadith that could be considered to be some kind of commentary uh, on the Quran. So mm -hmm. we, have, we have this huge problem of yes. writing, of misunderstanding revelation, mm -hmm. misunderstanding the Quran. Uh, and uh, uh, this, uh, the reason, main reason for this, the chief reason for this, I think was basically the marginalization of reason, the repression of reason, the subordination of reason to tradition, the subordination of the intellect or the akal to the nakal, and which was later followed by, as we already mentioned, the persecution of the thinkers. Mm -hmm. And that was later followed by uh, a, a return to the persecution of the thinkers by Al-Mutawakil, who ended the era of rationalism, of mm -hmm. the uh, rule of the Mutazilites, who were, by the way, accused of being atheists. Yes. And then uh, the, the, wa uh, the waves against rationalism continued with the even the official closure of the gates to ijtihad, in other words, uh, uh, the gates to juristic reasoning, reasoning mm -hmm. were officially closed. Even jurists or jurisprudence were not allowed to do any more thinking, so to speak. Uh -huh. <laughs> the, the, the point was that, well, the previous scholars have explained everything we need to know for all time to come, so there's no need for any new ijtihad. You see, mm -hmm. so this resulted in taklid, uh, a stagnation of Muslim thought, a dogmatism mm -hmm. of sorts, and uh, this was further reinforced by Al Ghazali's attack on the philosophers in the Tahafut al Falasafa, the incoherence of the philosophers. Yes. So the, this was very tragic because this anti rationalism, I think, retarded the evolution of the Muslim community in several ways. Mm -hmm. One, it, uh, which one should I begin with? Well, let me begin with the. Let me begin with uh, the retardation of the evolution of the arts and sciences, okay? Yes. So many, so many things became haram. You couldn't play a musical instrument. According to Al-Ghazali, if you heard a, mu a music coming out of any house, you had the right, 
perhaps obligation, not, I need to check this, to enter the house by force and destroy someone else's private property, his musical instruments in his house. Can mm -hmm. you believe this? This is yes. absolutely shocking. I mean, yeah, how yes. different is this from vigilante justice, from a Gestapo Nazi-like, uh, you mm -hmm. know, uh, uh, modus operandi? I was really yeah, shocked when I read that. It's, it's a brown shirt mentality is what it is. Well, yeah, brown shirt or whatever, black shirt or black flag mentality or whatever. You know? <laughs> yes. yes, that's what it is, unfortunately. Yes. In fact, speaking of black flags, I was recently texted by some fellow on Clubhouse inviting me to join a group of people for whom mm -hmm. the black flags are very important. Uh -huh. I, could, yes. I couldn't believe it, you see, and they mm -hmm. are waiting for the arrival of uh, the Mahdi and what have you. I don't want yeah. to go into yeah. any more detail, but you yeah. can see that these kind of delusions uh, still persist, you know, uh, among I, I uh, some like of the Muslims. I would discuss that narrative at, a, at, a, at another, another case and another session. Sure, sure. About the Mahdi. I think that's a very interesting topic that should be, needs to be explored. But perhaps now, thanks for bringing it up. I would like to uh, return to Leo Strauss and try and see if we can't draw parallels between what happened to his doctrine and what happened to uh, Islam, you see. Yes, yes. Uh, there, I, it's, it seems to me to be a, a, a pattern, you see. Yes, yes, uh, very well uh, said, I agree. I would just like to mention that sure. uh, Leo, Leo Strauss was apparently fond of telling his students uh, that he quoted this one proverb, I think, from the Old Testament, which says uh, that um, uh, fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Yes. But, that was one of his favorite expressions. He would always mention that to his yeah. people, his students. That's in the book he... of Proverbs, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. So anyway, so about what happened here, you see, once again, um, how do I put this? Yes, his ideas or, or some, how do I put this? Um, uh, some of the students that he had, and one example I mentioned was Paul Wolfowitz, who was the Under Secretary mm -hmm. of State, or was it the Pentagon? I'm not sure now. Mm -hmm. He was one of the signatories of the Project for a New American Century, which mm -hmm. called for an event comparable to a new Pearl Harbor to yes. uh, consolidate American public opinion behind mm -hmm. the government to, to, to mm -hmm. make possible the financing of a war in the, uh, some Middle Eastern countries. Mm -hmm. And I believe there were up to seven countries where uh, people were planning to uh, do a regime change. Yeah, there was one, one yeah. yeah, there was, I think General Wesley Clark even has a video on yes, that. He, uh, he confirmed so, it. so you see the, the, this uh, idea that you can stage an event or a false flag, by the way, false flags are very common. You of course they history. are. Yeah. yeah, you know that. You, we don't have to mm -hmm. go into that. But the idea that, um, you know, uh, the U.S. government should somehow uh, stage this kind of event mm -hmm. in order to achieve uh, or increase political dominance, dominance uh, mm -hmm. or hegemony in the broader world, uh, to me, is profoundly un-American, quite frankly, the way yes. I understand America, its principles, mm -hmm. and also is this profoundly anti what Leo Strauss taught on this issue of, is it? of, of Machiavellian mm -hmm. politics. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like the, the very first sentence, because the, this, whole, this whole staged event, 9-11, was actually a very Machiavellian you know, uh, 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 event operation, you see. Mm -hmm. It's based on the assumption that the ends justify the means. Yes. Strauss showed, among other things, in his book uh, called Thoughts on Machiavelli, which I recommend, I think it's an excellent work. Mm -hmm. he, de he demonstrated convincingly that this is a false, uh, you know, false, uh, this, uh, that uh, ends never justify uh, the means. In other words, okay. uh, Machiavelli was dead wrong on this. And in fact, uh, Strauss mm -hmm. opened the, the opening sentence in his book run something like this, I uh, speak from memory, but I try to re recall as accurately as I can. He says, I quote, but yeah, not, not totally perfectly, but as, as well as I can remember. He said, we shall not surprise anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, we shall merely shock 
a few people and perhaps expose ourselves to ridicule or some ridicule mm -hmm. if we profess ourselves inclined to the traditional view according to which Machiavelli was a teacher of evil, end of quote, mm -hmm. you see. So Machiavelli, uh, uh, I mean, Strauss condemned Machiavellism and the so-called realpolitik. However, there are people that have tried to pin, uh, you know, the events of 9-11 on him personally. And I can mention Barbara Honegger. She had a video on YouTube, which has since been taken down. When I tried to access it, it was taken down because the account mm -hmm. was terminated. But it was something about the attacks on the Pentagon. And uh, mm -hmm. she claimed that this, uh, you know, uh, whole 9-11 false flag was uh, uh, somehow she laid it at the door of Strauss's door as if he were responsible. That, mm -hmm. is, uh, that is a bunch of nonsense. And she wasn't well, alone. I, I, I thought that was the case years ago. That's why I want, I'm pursuing this conversation with you. Because you're saying, oh, no, no, that's not what happened. So I, I want to get the roots of what happened because... Lots of things have been blamed on Muslims because they say, well, this is what Islam teaches. And uh, it's the same. It's the same thing. You see. It's an analogy. Yeah. Islam doesn't yeah. teach these things. Of Strauss course not. did not teach these things. So who got in between the truth and the lie and the false actions, you see? Well, there were people, I suppose, who wanted to... Uh... I mean, there are some people who don't care, you see, about mm -hmm. uh, right and wrong. Mm -hmm. They are willing to do anything immoral and unethical and even against religion as long as it, they reach, they think they reach their objectives, mm -hmm. you see. So the, I think this was a sort of a, what do you call, some people call it the, the you've, I think you've referred to the hidden hand. <laughs> and yes. also the deep state, some people use, use the expression the deep state. There was a, yes. probably a group of people uh, in fact, I have a paper on it. I think it's still in academia, or have I mm -hmm. already? Because when I include a paper from uh, from academia on one of my books, I normally take it down from uh, the uh, research websites because... Yes, I've done the same thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazon will not allow you to publish it if they think that you may have copied it from somebody else on, on the yes. internet, even if even if it is you yourself <laughs> copied yes. from yourself. So <laughs> I stopped doing that. Yes. But anyway, so yeah, there's a lot of research, a lot of evidence that this was a staged event. I mm -hmm. mean, so many Americans don't believe it. I could name names, but I think we don't have to. You, you probably know it. Uh, Richard Gage mm -hmm. and the engineers and architects for Truth 9-11, you know. Uh, uh, General Stubblebine, who was the chief mm -hmm. of army intelligence of the U.S. Army, for Pete's sakes, he came out. And yes. there was another general, I think his name is Black. And also, mm -hmm. the, the, the list is just very long, many, right? Many, many. Many, so, many. What did people like Barbara do? Did they just take, okay, well, these were Strauss's students. This was their, uh, uh, this was their policy. So it's yeah. Strauss's fault. It, it just made yeah. guilt by yeah. association. Is that yeah. No, I think no probably the, mm. I think that probably the argument, uh, I, I, if I recall correctly, the argument went like this. In the Republic, Plato does have the teaching of the so-called noble lie. Uh, we touched mm. on this before. Yes. I think what he was referring to the, was the religion of the Athenians. Mm -hmm. I don't think he believed in the many gods, but for some reason he, well, perhaps because of what happened to his teacher Socrates, he didn't venture out into any open criticism of this polytheism. Yes, yes of course. Because after all, that was one of the charges against Socrates, that he was an apostate, you see. Mm -hmm. yes. He apostatized from the polytheism of the Athenians, you see. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Plato might have also uh, experienced some heat if he was openly critical of the polytheistic uh, beliefs of the Athenians. And remember mm -hmm. what Aristotle said when he escaped from Athens and went to join uh, and became the teacher of Alexander the Great under Philip in Macedonia. Yeah. He said he left Athens because he did not want Athens to sin against philosophy for the second time. You see? Ah, uh, yes, yes. So mm -hmm. this was a very, we have here a, a, an archetypal tension between the thinker or the dissident and the majority, yeah. you see, between, yeah. between uh, uh, wisdom and power. 
you see yes, yes so wisdom has to take steps to protect itself now in the case of socrates yeah. you can power you should can... be protecting wisdom but when power corrupts then that this is exactly what happens. Yeah. exactly so now for instance in the prophet muhammad peace be on him we have a rare example of where the power and the wisdom is com and the guidance is combined in a single person so mm. he did brilliantly but yes. what about the people that came after him could mm. they uh, keep up uh, the, the the work in a way that he did uh, mm. well what happened after his demise suddenly we have a whole bunch of conflicts and civil wars happening mm. Sahaba against mm -hmm. Sahaba, 15,000 yes. Sahaba died, according to Shahrur, in the first fitna alone, which was mm -hmm. consisted of two battles, the Battle of the Camel and the Battle of Sifin. So what happened, you see? And then we have, of course, the Sunni Shia divide that came afterwards and a few other fitnas. Mm -hmm. But to come back to, to, to Strauss once again, I think he was unfairly blamed for this because people may have felt threatened by what they may have perceived as his so-called authoritarianism, you know, because mm -hmm. people, as you know, in the West, and I lived in Canada for 19 years, people in the West, the moment you say, you use an expression like, this is the truth or the absolute truth, they will look at mm -hmm. you like kind of funny. You mean you believe in absolute truth? As yeah. if it was some, some kind of a uh, elementary error that you are. So I'm not saying that he, Strauss never used the expression absolute no. truth. I, but, but Hegel did, for example. But anyway, mm -hmm. he did, Strauss did talk about the, the difference between right and wrong, and he differentiated uh, between uh, justice that is transhistorical and transnational, which was based on what he called natural right, or what is right by nature, you see, just mm -hmm. by nature, and history, where in a, a big, uh, and history, because in history, the conception of what is fair and just changes as the time passes by, right? Yes. But there is a universal standard of justice. And the, we find this idea also in the Quran. Allah says, at least in three different in, in at least three different places, we will never find a change in the words of Allah. They don't change. Yes. And the Sunnah of Allah also does not change. So That's there's a certain permanent. Right. <laughs> so I think people may have felt threatened by this perceived absolutism, if you like. I don't think that's mm -hmm. quite the right word. It doesn't quite do justice to it. Just because you uh, believe in a difference between right and wrong, that does not make you an absolutist or a totalitarian or a dictator, if you see what I'm yes, saying. Yes, of course. Of course. But that, that, that was the perception among some people, you see. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, Barbara Honecker wasn't alone. And by the way, she's a pretty sharp lady. She's mm -hmm. very intelligent, except I think she got it badly wrong on this issue with Strauss. I see. But anyway, um, she worked, by the way, in the White House for two presidents. I think she was, uh, you know, quite close to, to two of the f uh, former presidents. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, who was it, Reagan and maybe Bush? Uh, I need mm -hmm. to check that. But anyway, so, so uh, yes, this is unfortunate because people's words become distorted and uh, the followers of leaders very often transgress and they go too far. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to go very far to find this also in Muslim intellectual history. Because uh -huh. the Quran teaches that war, waging jihad, is permitted only in two cases. One is self-defense and two is fighting against persecution. Mm -hmm. It does not uh, you know, endorse any kind of aggressive war known as jihad al-Talab. Uh, but uh, in other words, it does not allow spreading Islam by the sword. Mm -hmm. But this is what the concept of aggressive jihad, jihad al-Talab, says. Mm -hmm. The ulama, and almost without exception, I could not find a single name among the leading ulama who mm -hmm. actually rejected this notion of jihad al-Talab. They almost, to, to, to a man, accepted it. Well, this is that, analogous... Yeah. This is analogous to winning hearts and minds for democracy, correct? Yeah, spreading Islam. <laughs> yeah, spreading Islam by the sword or spreading democracy by the cruise missile. Sure, yes. Yes. there's a there's a concept of manifest destiny here <coughs> yes. in both cases. I remember yes. reading about manifest yes. destiny in my history yes. course years ago, mm -hmm. and then I realized well, the uh, Muslims, some of the Muslim ulama had also a, a similar concept. Manifest yes. destiny. And they also came up with this concept of the clash of civilizations. They had so that the, too. The errors made are the same. They're same. the same errors. Exactly. You, yeah. you can change the name of the error, uh, but it's still the same error. Absolutely. So the conflict of clash of civilization 
they had a different name for it. They said it's a clash between the Darul Islam and the Darul Harb, the abode of Islam, the abode of war. Sometimes the abode of war was referred to as the Darul Kufr, the abode of disbelief. And they believed that there was this inevitable clash, like Said mm -hmm. Qutb used to argue, and some of the Islamists also uh, argue, uh, I believe uh, Maududi is among them, and even Ibn Taymiyyah. So mm -hmm. these these people, and uh, but unfortunately, even some of the traditional, well, mm -hmm. not some, nearly all traditional ulama subscribe to this doctrine of jihad or talab, and mm -hmm. th that does not exclude even Al Ghazali. You see, he yeah. also supported the doctrine of jihad, al and so did Mawardi. And so I found mm -hmm. a passage in Ibn Khaldun's Muqaddimah where he also endorses it. And uh, Ibn Rush says, based in one of his writings, that in fact all the major uh, jurists endorse this idea that um, the Muslims are required to spread Islam uh, by the word and by the sword if necessary. And they mm -hmm. are required to fight against non-Muslims to spread Islam, even when the non-Muslims are not fighting against the Muslims. Now, I this see. is catastrophic. It is so catastrophic. To, so, mm. so to me, you know, the Nuremberg Code says that the aggressive war is a, is a crime, right? So yes. it definitely wouldn't. But Allah also says that this kind of uh, there, there's, uh, makes it clear that aggressive warfare is not permitted. It is a crime. Yes. In fact, I, re I referred to this and I have put it in writing to this idea that the community is required to go wage war on non-Muslims once mm -hmm. a year. They made it into a six pillar of Islam, as I mentioned last time. Yes. This idea and that the Muslims... me when you made that statement. That... Yeah. So, uh, so I was, uh, you know, I, I think of it, this, this notion of uh, waging aggressive jihad on people who are, have no hostile intentions towards you, who are not fighting against you. Yes. To yes. me, I, 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 please help me out, but I don't see much difference between that and what some people call state terrorism. Please correct me yes. if I'm missing anything. No, no, that's the same. It seems that what happened here is that they, the people who believed in manifest destiny of the West, for example, or wanted to use that idea for their purposes, uh, for their ends, they used the noble lie that they attributed to uh, Leo Strauss and then uh, laid it at his feet so that they could prosecute this uh, uh, noble lie and then take over what... Uh, uh, Russia and China seem to be taking over with respect to the landmass extension of their road from, you know, the Far East, uh, Japan, all the way through to Constantinople. Um, they, they wanted to prevent this and keep it in the Western autonomy. But is that really the true motive? I, I don't think so. I think that just sets up another um, uh, dichotomy uh, another narrative, another polar opposite, so we can keep up, maintain the tension, because the pure end here is the global governance, which is stands above all of this. So what they were doing, they, 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 they used the noble eye to create this contention, so that they could then position everybody to surrender to regionalization under a global governance which was not possible before this time, especially since the Freemasons uh, created the first international institutions these last 300 years under the Commonwealth, which is now what we call the, the Commonwealth Nations, and that's the largest corporation that ever exists in the face of, in, in, in the history of the world. And most people don't understand this or comprehend it. Comprehend it. I mean, it's bigger than Microsoft and all these others. And uh, if you look at if you look at Google, for example, all right. I was just discussing this in the seminars that I'm giving. You know, the, the the Google logo is the Freemasonic apron. You know, see this M. <laughs> That's what small it is. world. Yes, yeah, a small world. So they're 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 closing the borders of the world in order to maintain, uh, establish this global governance. And they use this noble lie that they lay at the foot of Strauss when it's actually something else completely, okay? So before we go any further, can you make a, a few 
comment or teach us what the real essence of this noble eye actually is or was in the minds of those who did propose it. For example, you know, what did Plato say about it? What did, uh, you know, uh, other philosophers down to the ages have to say about it? And what did Strauss have to say about it? And how did it get twisted? Okay. Yeah, well, I would first suggest uh, that um, to get a good understanding of uh, Plato's notion of the noble eye, probably one couldn't do better than read Plato himself on the issue. Yes, of course. Uh, which I have done, but it has been some time ago. But if I mm-hmm. recall correctly, he was suggesting that the so-called noble eye uh, was required for the masses, you see, because mm-hmm. the masses uh, needed uh, some kind of a narrative to keep them united and to. Uh, but here I, I I might be skating on thin ice because, like I said, it's been some time. But like I said, mm-hmm. I interpret the noble eye as him basically uh, going uh, refer- him basically saying that we should not challenge the uh, multiplicity of gods that the Athenians believed in at the time. That was the that was the lie that he was pre- uh, somehow he felt that uh, he didn't want to challenge that that lie. Now, that's from a Muslim point of view, that was definitely not a noble lie at all. Yeah. However, as we know, he was not a Muslim, and so. But like I say, I I would say that the best thing to do is to 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 to, to read it. But you know, we have. Uh, I mean, we have so much deception going on, in every, even in the West, you know, the, the official channels of uh, communication, CNN and what have you. The, the, can you trust yeah. these outlets to tell you the truth? Or are we getting noble lies practically on a daily basis? You know, we are, we are yeah. saturated with lies. I wouldn't call them noble. It's probably not right to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the reason he used the word noble to, in front of the word lie is because it had some usefulness, you see. They, they were mm-hmm. the, to, to keep the masses content or to, to pacify them, you know, to keep them mm-hmm. <clears throat> becoming upset. Because as you know, people can react very violently when you begin to challenge their gods or, or critique yes, their gods. Right. They are mm-hmm. very strongly attached. Look what happened with Ibrahim, Alayhisselam, when he, mm-hmm. you know, uh, destroyed the gods, except the biggest one, the people, they tried to burn him, right? Mm-hmm. Well, look yeah. what happened to Prophet Muhammad when he preached the message of monotheism. Mm-hmm. People tried yeah. to kill him too, you see. Yeah, so when you challenge these, these very basic <clears throat> beliefs, you know, and now we have certain ulama. Are they being? Have they become? Have they been idolized in some cases? You see, this is another mm-hmm. issue. Mm-hmm. That when we say we cannot critique any of the leading imams, and in fact, the imams, the traditional ulama, basically stated for the record that anyone who disagrees with them or takes a different opinion from theirs has mm-hmm. left the fold of Islam. Okay. They basically, you, you, if you disagree with the leading alim, you have become an apostate, mm-hmm. and you know what follows. Mm-hmm. What's supposed to happen to people who, uh, who leave Islam? Okay, so, so that that means that you know, even if you know that what they're <coughs> stating and what the people are following is a lie, it's a noble lie because if you leave it alone, you maintain peace. Is it, 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 it something like that? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Now I know it's. It's not a very yeah. credible argument, and and no. but you know okay. in in the Quran in the Quran we have a, a verse in uh, Surah sixteen, uh, verse one twenty five, where Allah gives us a clue of, mm-hmm. of how to speak to people. You see, and I put that yeah. quote in my my book, and Sheikh Imran was uh, reading it when he was looking over my book some years ago when he was here. The the verse says, "Speak to them in the best way." You see. When you mm-hmm. do, you know, talk to them about it. So, so what is this best way to speak to people? You see, mm-hmm. so we, uh, we, I believe that we Muslims can and should tell the truth, but we should do it in the best way. You see, so mm-hmm. okay. <laughs> before we can do it in the best way, we need to know what is the best way. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm confronted with this uh, with this challenge every day in my uh, in my mm-hmm. writing. You know, is this the best way that I can put this this point? You see, <laughs> and some of my yes. papers have gone through endless revisions, brother. It's just unbelievable. Mm-hmm. I mean, yes. my I think my one of my recent uh, last papers at the institute where I worked as a research fellow, the, the paper on uh, reconciliation of reason and revelation in education. Mm-hmm. It, it went through about uh, 700 drafts, believe it or oh not. I, I, I mean, revision. Revision. I, I, I know where you're coming from. <laughs> exactly. You're a book writer too, so you know exactly what, yeah. I'm, writing, what I'm talking yeah. about. 
Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's a very delicate thing because uh, languages yeah. can be very tricky and the same word may mean two different things to different people, you see. Yes, yes. It, so because, I mean, every every reading is an interpretation, even if you read yeah. the text in, in your native tongue, because everybody reads whatever they read in light of their prior experience mm-hmm. and knowledge, okay. and of course they may respond to it differently. Well, that's one approach to the noble lie. There's another approach here that uh, I think is more commonly understood, and that is, okay, so we have 9-11, we blame it on the Muslims, that's the noble lie. And uh, that allows us to go invade their countries and destroy the final enemy to uh, our ultimate goal, which is world government. That's a noble lie, as far as they're concerned. I'm not sure that Strauss would have uh, uh, endorsed this. No, he wouldn't. Okay, well, uh, uh, elaborate on that then. Yeah, you see, uh, to get to the real motive for this, there's an interesting Mm -hmm. interview uh, on YouTube with um, Ken Livingstone, the former mayor of London, and um, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this English chap, um, uh, and they're talking about the real motive of why these wars are being waged. And Ken Livingstone Mm -hmm. pointed out the simple fact he used the uh, he uh, referred to the war in Ukraine and said that look, the military industrial complex is making a lot of money out of this conflict, yes. because these people are sending. Uh, I mean, uh, U.S. government is sending all this military hardware to Ukraine. That mm-hmm. costs money. Somebody has yeah. to pay for it, right. and then once this equipment is sent, it has to be replaced. And yeah. whoever is going to be replacing it is going to be looking at some uh, hefty profits. You see. Yes, so course. so the military, uh, I mean, uh, industrial complex, which we were warned against by Eisenhower already, to get yeah. a, a hand in glove with NATO, uh, mm-hmm. basically this is enriching a group of uh, super rich persons and companies. So basically mm-hmm. what we are looking at is uh, profits. And even in Iraq, who mm-hmm. was supplying the services for the U.S. troops? Uh, during the Iraqi occupation. Well, it was a company called Halliburton. And who was at one time the chief uh, officer of this company? Does the name Dick Cheney ring a bell? You see? So this is not rocket science. This is about money. No, it's not. It's about money and control and power. Even if you look at the the chain of command here, you never get to the puppet master. So that means you, you might be able to lay your eyes on someone like Dick Cheney, but there's always a master above him. So uh, from from my perspective, from what I've understood of the history of this organized evil, this uh, study of uh, polarology, if you will, uh, God bless uh, uh, Dr. Lobachevsky for writing that book. If you haven't read it, please, you should add it to your library and study it because it's very necessary to become informed at this moment in time. Okay, in particular. So I think we've uh, we've covered quite a bit of space there, uh, dear brother, uh, regarding uh, Leo Strauss and what happened with the neoconservative and the noble lie and the different approaches to understanding what the noble eye might be. We may not be definitive in that matter, but at least we we open the box and allow people to think about these things if they're tuning in to listen to us and see, well, this isn't something that just happened to uh, Western democracy. This also happened to uh, what we recognize as Islam early on, and it repeatedly happens. There's some sort of a lie that's always lurking there, and there's also some sort of a gang that's promoting that lie, and they're twisting the words of their teachers, uh, the ones who were sent to instruct them, and uh, internally um, um, put their thought process together for the purposes of good. Well, if their intentions are selfish, they will take those doctrines, they will take those principles, they will twist them, and then um, use them to create some form of noble lie, which is going to cause the masses to run out, put their uniforms on, or get their black flags or whatever it might be, and go start killing the wrong people. People who are strangers, people who have no intentions of harming them. And yet they will go into their house and destroy their musical instruments just because somebody said so. 
thousands or hundreds of years ago. Let's go do it. It's the Sunnah. Uh, well, is it? <laughs> uh, so, uh, brother, uh, any other comment you would like to add? To that before we close? Yeah, perhaps I can just add one more thing. You know, we have this noble eye. Actually, we have something uh, akin to it even in the Hadith literature. I don't know if you recall that Hadith where apparently the Prophet said, peace be on him, that it's okay to tell a lie if the effect is beneficial. For example, mm -hmm. I can lie to my wife if it mm -hmm. makes her feel better. This mm -hmm. is incredible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, but it's yeah. there. So it is, we call them white lies sometimes, but we can call this a noble lie, but it is still a lie, you see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the idea that the end justifies the means actually is also very strong in, present in Islamic, tradi uh, traditional Islamic jurisprudence, you see. Yeah. There's this yeah. concept of sadhu zaraya, which is in English, it is rendered as blocking the means which is one of the sources of the law, according to traditional scholars. And basically it says that uh, an act can be declared to be illegal if that act can lead to another act which is illegal. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Another, yes. The key, key word here is can lead to it. It does not necessarily mm -hmm. have to lead to it. So we have, for example, a crime uh, of uh, close proximity which has been uh, being alone with a woman who is not your relative in a secluded place was declared a crime but of close proximity by the ulama mm -hmm. despite the fact that allah ta'ala never made any such prohibition what he prohibited yes. was zina or adultery you see he did yes, not yes. prohibit being alone with a person who uh, who is uh, not uh, not a family member being with that person yes. together in the same so they criminalized what is basically inappropriate behavior this is a very mm -hmm. very troubling development you see well, you you might want to discourage that kind of behavior but you don't have to criminalize it for god's exactly. sake exactly so like we have that in iran now they are they have criminalized not wearing the hijab it's the same thing yeah they're killing the women over there exactly so yeah I, I don't them, for god's sake uh, and this is zealotry i mean this is extremism fanaticism and also the, i would the, add the, the and the iranian prime minister just the other day day has the gall to say Iran's never been stronger. Iran's never been stronger. And your police are going out on the streets and braining beautiful, young, innocent women because they don't want to wear the hijab. This is not the greatest <laughs> accomplishment of any nation. You see, this is, this is savagery. This is the release of savagery. And uh, that's actually what, what took place after 9-11, isn't it? The release of savagery, you know. And it took place again in Vietnam, the release of savagery. So this means we're, we're not in control of our actions at all at the national and even international levels. So who's controlling this? Whoever's, whoever's promoting and propagating a lie? Yeah, it seems that way. Well, my response to that would be, brother, is that there's an interesting verse in our Quran where Allah Ta'ala says, It means they plotted and planned, but Allah also plotted and planned. And Allah yes. is the best of planners. And yes. of course, so no matter how delicate or deep or intricate the plot of your uh, Freemasons or whoever is sitting at the top of this pyramid is, they will never be able to outsmart Allah. <clears throat> they will never be able to plan better than Allah. And he will bring them down. It's just a matter of time because it has yes. always happened in the past. And yes. we will never find a change in the Sunnah of Allah. So these this people are deluding true. themselves if they think that they can succeed against you know, uh, Allah's plan. Allah's plan is strong, is another word. This, this, is, this is true. But the savagery, nevertheless, is, is true and it well, has its effects. For some so, reason, he allows it to happen. He could, have, he could mm -hmm. put a stop to it, but for some reasons known to him, he, he allowed it to happen. Uh, sometimes he uh, intervenes and stops things from happening, and sometimes I think he, he lets it happen. Now, Mm -hmm. uh, we could speculate on on those reasons, but perhaps this isn't the time or place to do it. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that uh, you know Allah Taala is ultimately the one in control. Uh, and, I agree uh, with that. 
I agree with Nothing that. can happen without his permission or his command. If he commands yeah, it, it happens. True. If he if he lets it happen, it's not like he wanted this evil to happen, but you mm -hmm. know, he for some yeah. reason he lets it happen. And we cannot blame him for these evil deeds because okay. there are many verses no. in the Quran oh, no, say that these no. these yeah, these bad things that are happening to you are happening to you because of what your hands sent forth, right? Yes. Not, this is not what this Allah, is. yeah. Exactly. This is an absolute truth. It is an absolute truth. There's no doubt about that. So, dear brother, let's make an end there. And um, I would like next week if we could take up and return to the um, the origins of the Fatimid uh, Caliphate and what happened. How did this come to oppose the Sunni position? And why did they last for as long as they did until um, Salahuddin uh, tore them out of uh, Cairo and wherever else they were insinuating themselves? Uh, how did that come about? So uh, if we can turn our attentions there and then continue with this uh, historical narrative uh, that will help our listeners to understand, better understand the history of what has become uh, known as Islam in the Muslim world, uh, I would appreciate that. So thank you once again, dear brother, for and thank you too. I uh, thank taking this time to share with me, and uh, enjoy the rest of your. My evening. pleasure. Same and to you, brother, and thank you for having me. Inshallah, we'll see you again next week. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.